Matthew 7 is where you are turning. As you are turning there, there have been many things well-intended people have done over very long periods of time to try and win people over to Christ. Multitudes of people have followed these examples and claimed Christ or claimed Christianity without really understanding anything of what they are doing. To name just a few of these examples would be the prosperity gospel. God will bless you financially and physically if you just believe on Him. The infamous, just repeat these words, raise your hand and you will be saved, sinner's prayer. Or the now becoming popular, overly nice gospel. Love them with the gospel, use words if necessary. Now I truly believe, with every depth of my soul, the attempts to win these people into everlasting life were well intended, were well intended by the men that did them. However, were really schemes of Satan that has damned many to everlasting destruction. God will use whatever means He pleases to lead people into everlasting life. However, I believe that Satan uses different schemes to lure us away from Christ. In Matthew 7, just before we come to our text this morning, we are warned of these false teachers. Second Peter says these false teachers will, bring, will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord Himself, and they will bring on themselves swift destruction. Many will follow in their destructive ways, by whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction will not sleep. This morning with our time, I want us to think about our own lives today. I want us to examine our own hearts. Where are you? I want us to think upon our salvation. If you are a believer today, if you have a testimony, if you have salvation, I want you to think upon your own salvation and where does it lie? And does it lie in your profession of who Christ is, of what you say, or does it lie in the possession that you have of Him? Profession, not possession of Christ. J.C. Ryle, he says here, he says, The Lord winds up the Sermon on the Mount. If you're familiar with Matthew, he starts the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, and he ends at, at the end of Matthew 7, or towards the end of Matthew 7, and he wraps up the Sermon on the Mount with heart-piercing application. He turns from false prophets to false professors, from unsound teachers to unsound hearers. This here is a word for us all, and may we have grace to apply it to our own hearts today. If you're with me in Matthew 7 for context, we're going to start in verse 13 and read through verse 23. The word of the Lord says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes, or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. And then we come to this morning's text. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast demons out in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I, Jesus says, will declare to them, I never knew you, 
Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This is the word of the Lord. God, we ask for your help this morning. Lord, Spirit of God, I ask for your help today. That it would not be my word spoken, but your word spoken through me. Spirit, I ask for each of us, myself included, and everyone here, that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us understanding. Lord, that we would examine our own hearts today, and that God, you would be glorified. Christ, may you save. Spirit of God, may you give life. May you give comfort. May you give assurance. Help us now. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our rock and redeemer. In Christ's name, amen. Verse 21 opens up here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, first, before we get dive too deep into this text, we need to first understand that all one day will be judged. Hebrews 9 tells us that it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And women, you're not discluded from that. That is men and women. It is appointed unto all once to die, and then the judgment. So at the judgment, Christ is saying here, not all who call him Lord, Lord, will enter into his kingdom. Some will, but not all who call him Lord, Lord, will enter into his kingdom. As we examine ourselves, which one are you? Will you enter? Will you be cast out? The calling of him Lord here is nothing more than lip service unless the heart is behind it. It is good that we call him Lord. John 13, 13, Jesus says, You call me teacher and Lord, for it is well, for so I am. But a profession of faith does not save a man. A profession of faith does not save a man. A baptism will not save a man. Church attendance, tithing, seminary education, being a teacher of the word, reading the Bible daily are all wonderful, great, glorious things. However, they cannot save you. An outward profession should be there for every single believer. However, that outward profession does not save us. It takes much more than people want to give credit for especially in today's society, to lead someone to the Lord. It is much more than repeated words after another individual. Do we really think that mere words, do we really think that mere words could justify us with the creator of the universe who requires our entire life, not just an outward sign? If the heart does not match the mouth, then we have become nothing more than a clanging cymbal or sounding brass. Notice in this verse that you will see the people say, Lord, Lord. And anytime you see a repetitive word or phrase in Scripture, it holds an importance to us. This statement, Lord, Lord, shows that people thought they really believed that they had a relationship with Christ. This was personal. This was something that was frequent. This was common practice. So if not calling on Christ as Lord, as we see in this text, not all will, who call me Lord will be saved, then what will? Verse 21 continues, and it gives us the answer to this question. It says, He who does the will of my Father will enter into the kingdom. So this only leaves us one question today. What is the will of God? What is the will of the Father? I have a few verses on the screen for you as you follow along. John 6, 40. And this is the will of him who sent me. Well, who sent Jesus? The Father. This is the will of the Father. That everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. How do you do the will of God? You believe on the Son. Believe on Christ. You believe that Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He is the Messiah. He is the Anointed One, the Eternal Son of God, the only One who is ever sinless, the One who offers us salvation through His sacrifice, the One who God raised from the dead, who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, the One who is ruling and reigning at the right hand of God and will come back again to judge the living and the dead, and the One that all creation 
will bow down and confess that he is Lord. And he, this Christ, will raise you up. Ephesians 5, as you see the next verse. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Be filled with the Spirit. How do you be filled with the Spirit? Well, you believe on the Son. This is the work of God. You believe on the Son. He will fill you with His Spirit. For God says, through the prophet Ezekiel, I will take out your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my ways and I will keep you will keep my commandments and do them. First Thessalonians, for this is the will of God, your sanctification or your growing in holiness, your separation from sin and growing towards God. How are we to do these things? How are we to be sanctified? We are to be sanctified by believing on the son, by the spirit of God at work inside of us. It's the work of God. The Spirit inside of us, convicting us over sin, causing us to repent of it, that we may grow in holiness, that we may grow in the knowledge and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for Christ Jesus, or in Christ Jesus for you. How are we to do these things? Once again, it's by believing on the Son. It's God putting His Spirit within us. It's Christ it's God doing the work, being filled with the Spirit of God and relying on God to do the work in us. Now I want you to notice in every one of these applications that it is God who does the work. According to the prophet Jeremiah, our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know them? Paul tells us in his letters to the Ephesians, to the Ephesian church, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And I want to be very clear to you today. A dead man can do no work for God. God is the one who does the work in you. You can go through motions. You can be baptized. You can have a profession of faith. You can attend church your entire life. You can be good according to the standards of the world. But if you do not possess Christ, if God has not his, put His Spirit within you, if Christ is not alive in you, then you are still dead in your sins and cannot enter into the kingdom. James 1, for those who have been attending our small groups and been going through the book of James, James 1, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If we do not comply with the will of God, yet we claim Him as Lord, we are no different than those who mock Christ, crown Him with thorns, robed him in purple, and our profession might as well be hail, King of the Jews. It is not your profession of faith or the strength of your faith that saves you, but it is who your faith is in. It is not the size of your faith, but the object of your faith that saves you. Profession of Christ without possession of Christ. Let me repeat that. Profession of Christ without possession of Christ is nothing more than a Judas's kiss. Staying with the text, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast demons out in your name and done many wonders in your name? Excuse me. Now we see that many will say on that day, that day of judgment, where we will all stand before our Creator and be judged on account of what we have done. Not a few, not one or two, not a certain group of people, but many. And this many is not just the common, but this is those who hold offices in the church. From the high ups to the low ends. This many will call Christ Lord, Lord, whether it is intimate or not. They will call Him Lord. Their hearts will be revealed on that day. Their hearts will be revealed. So even when they cannot claim Him, they cannot claim any interest in God Himself, in the Lord, because of their wickedness that has now been revealed, they cannot deny His power, they cannot de deny His authority. They cannot de deny His leadership, His lordship, His dominion, or His kingship. Therefore, they will have no choice but to call Him Lord. 
These many now go on to try and justify their own self to their maker and judge. None of us in here, including myself, ever try to justify our sins. This hypocritical plea against God and the strictness of His law is just an act to offer other things rather than obedience. The greatest strength of what these men have to offer will be but weakness. The things that they hold close to them and offer to God instead of submission will be what damns them to everlasting punishment. They hold close to their works. But what do the scriptures say? Isaiah 64. But we are all like an unclean thing. And all of our righteousness are yet but filthy rags. Romans 8.8 8, For those who are in the flesh, not of the Spirit, those who do not have the Spirit of God inside of them, can not please God. They lay their salvation... And we're examining our own hearts today. And this was a struggle in me as I prepared this sermon. They lay their salvation on what has been done in Christ's name, not on Christ Himself. They did what they thought was right in their own eyes instead of submitting to the will of God. May we look at their pleas of mere excuses. They first say, we have prophesied. Have we not prophesied in your name? One commentator has said, This may be understood as foretelling of things to come or the preaching of the Word of God. Is it really possible? Is it really possible for those who prophesied, who foretold of the future, who foretold of things to come, to really be far from God and not enter into His kingdom? Why, yes, for Christ himself says so right here in this verse. For the prophet Balaam, if you're not familiar with Balaam, Numbers 22. For the prophet Balaam prophesied many times blessing on Israel from God, and even prophesied of the coming Messiah. Yet Balaam desired the gift of man over the will of God, and is marked as a false teacher in three separate passages of the New Testament. Caiaphas was the high priest. We're familiar with Caiaphas because we, as Christians, we should be familiar with the death and resurrection of our Lord Christ Jesus. Caiaphas was the high priest. He prophesied from God to the people that Jesus would die for the nations. Yet he accused Christ of blasphemy and then would approve of his death. Look at these verses with me. It's kind of long. Just follow along with me as we read these verses. And one of them, Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now he did not, this he did not say on his own authority, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So Caiaphas prophesies. Then Matthew 26, as we look at this familiar passage, and those who had laid hold of him and laid hold of Jesus, led Jesus away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. And the high priest, Caiaphas, arose and said, Do you answer nothing? Was it these men, what is it these men testify against you? But Jesus had kept silent. And the high priest answered him and said, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest, Caiaphas, he tore his clothes, a sign of anguish. He spoke, he has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard this blasphemy. Here are just two examples of men who foretold or prophesied of what was yet to come, yet did not enter into the kingdom of God. There are also those who preach the word, those who may occupy a pulpit, 
who still may be far from the kingdom of Christ. These men may claim to be preaching in the name of Christ. They may pretend to have mission and authority from the Lord Himself, yet have no understanding of true grace and divine mercy. Matthew Henry, in his commentary, said here, Note, a man may be a preacher. He may have gifts for ministry and an external call to it, and perhaps some success in it. For God will use the reprobate to bring glory to Himself. And yet that man may be wicked. He may help others to heaven, and yet come short himself. I personally have a friend of mine who I've grown to know over the last few years who grew up in church, and some of you have heard me tell the story before. Uh, a friend of mine named Jonathan and he grew up in church, was, was drugged to church all the time by his parents, went through church, went through his youth group, graduated high school, felt the call of the Lord to go to seminary. Leaves, 18, goes to seminary, graduates, four years, out of seminary, goes and takes a full-time pastor, youth pastor job in Alabama. At 25 years old, as he's studying one night for his Wednesday night Bible study, as a full-time youth pastor, been there for at least three years, is reading through the book of Romans, convicted to his core of not knowing Christ, and was saved that day, then and there. He later consulted with his elders about this, because he was torn in pieces. I, I've, been, I've been preaching, I've been teaching for years, yet I did not know the Lord. They worked with him. They put him under trial period. He is now a pastor of a church about 45 minutes from here. I tell you these stories. I tell you these situations because these things are true. It is a hard to process that men would preach from the pulpit or men would prophesy in the name of the Lord and yet not know him. Yet it is possible to do mighty works for Christ and still be far from him. The next plea you see in verse 22 is we've cast out demons in your name. Several scholars have said this demon possession was frequent in the times of Christ. These scholars would go on to say that the frequency from that was to show the power of Christ over Satan. That Christ was on earth so the demon possession would be higher than so that Christ's power may be known and shown. Christ's power was so strong that He could give His power to His disciples and that they would have His power now to cast out these demons through His name. Now you cannot preach this text without bringing up Judas, the son of perdition or the son of destruction. Judas himself was hand-picked. Let me repeat that. Judas himself was hand-picked by Christ. God, who knows all things, to be his disciple. Judas, as well as the other 11 disciples, was given authority and power from Christ to cast out demons. Look at these verses in Matthew 10, just a couple chapters over. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, Jesus had, he gave them power over unclean spirits and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus, Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Judas had the power to cast out demons. Judas is one here who Christ speaks of in this verse. But Judas is not the only one that Christ is speaking of. For he says, many will say to me on that day, what about the Jewish exorcist and the seven sons of Sceva that Pastor Ryan Melson preached on a few weeks back? If y'all were here for that, if you weren't, I encourage you to go look the sermon up on YouTube. Acts 19. Then some of the Jewish exorcists took it among themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus who, over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you, we get rid of you. We cast you out by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? 
Now we know, in this specific instance, these men did not have success. They were actually ran out of the place naked and kind of embarrassed. However, we do know that this was not their first attempt. Many a man may cast out demons, yet be full of demons himself. There may be those who cast out devils, yet at the day of judgment be sent to the devil. Their last plea that we see here is, they've done many wonders in your name. We've done many wonders in your name. There may be a faith of miracles, yet no saving faith at all. Once again, your works, no matter how great, no matter how awesome, your works will not justify you with the holy God. John Gill has said, Judas, for one, was capable of pleading all of these things. He had the gift of preaching and a call from Christ to do it, yet a castaway. He had the power of casting out devils, yet could not prevent the devil himself from entering him. He could perform miracles, do wonders in Christ's name, yet at last was the betrayer of Christ himself. Note that these pleas are by those who have done mighty things for God. Not one of them had did the small things, but the big things. These are not pleas of, I have been faithful to my spouse. Or I went to church every day. I never forsook the assembling. I never forsook the Sabbath. Or I fed the poor in the name of Christ. Now I want to point something out. These things are not, these things are the great things. Work done for the Lord will not be done in vain. We are called by Christ to do these things throughout the Scriptures. We have a ministry here called Matthew 25 to call on those who are sick and in the hospital and who are homebound to encourage them, to pray with them. Why? Because Jesus says in Matthew 25 to do these things to the least of these, who those who can't do it for themselves is to be doing it unto Him Himself. You should feed the hungry. You should clothe the naked. You should pray and visit the sick and the imprisoned. You should be faithful to your spouse. You should attend church every Sunday. You should read your Bible daily. You should love your kids. And you should even love your enemies. However, hear me now. These works, no matter how glorious they may be, and how God may use them will not save you by themselves. Works cannot save you. Faith in the Son of God will save you. And true, honest, devout, saving faith will produce these works in you. Look at me at verse 23, how Christ wraps this up. He says, And I will declare to them on that day, I never knew you. Depart from me who practice lawlessness. Christ now addressed the reward of these deceitful imposters. I never knew you. Are some of the scariest words in the entire scriptures. Christ will declare these words. This will not be quiet. This will not be relaxed. This will not be superficial. He will declare publicly with all authority from heaven and on earth as judge and creator. I never knew you. Just as many of these men did these works to lift themselves up in front of the crowds, in front of many people, often to put money in their own pockets, Christ will declare it in the presence of all the angels and all the saints who have gone before them. Notice Christ does not say, because this seems to be popular in today's society. Christ does not say, I knew you, but gave you back over to your sin. He does not say, I only knew you for that one time you repented until you sinned the next time. He does not say, I knew you, and it broke my heart that you wouldn't know me. He simply says, I never knew you. These men were not saved and then lost their salvation. They were never Christ's sheep. Let me try to make this a bit clearer. What Christ is saying here is, I never knew you. I never had any love or affection for you. I never lifted you up or exalted you. I never claimed you as mine or belonging to me. 
I never approved of you. I never approved of the things you did or the things you thought. I never had any form of communication with you, nor did you with me. I have not known you from old, from everlasting. You were not my father's choice, nor were you mine. Your name was not written down in my book, nor was it found in the everlasting covenant. I never knew you as my sheep for whom I died. I never knew you to believe in me or love me or love the things that I loved or the people who were mine. I have seen you in my house. I have seen you in my creation. I have seen you in my scriptures. I have seen you in prayer, yet I have never seen you exalt me. I have seen you lift up my sacrifice. I have never seen you lift up my sacrifice, my blood, or my righteousness. You talk about the great things you have done, but I know of not one good thing you have ever done in your entire life. You are here in my presence with your words, and yet I hear you not, nor see you not. I will have nothing to do with you. Depart from me. Get away from me. Now what grounds does Christ have to cast these men from him? He says, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Or some translations render it, you workers of iniquity. You who do not do the will of the Father. You who will not be filled with the Spirit. You who would not believe on me. You who would not be sanctified. You who would not submit to my authority. By this I will cast you out. You who practice lawlessness. You who defy my commandments. If you were filled with the Spirit, if you had believed on the Son, if you would have loved me and my commandments, but you did not. You have loved the created thing over the Creator. You have loved your sin over me. You have not only fell into sin, but you have made it habitual habit. You have completely ignored my laws. Jesus says in John, or excuse me, in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Brothers and sisters, there are those who had claimed... Excuse me, there are those who had God's name in their mouth, yet had rebellion in their hearts. They claim to love God with their lips, but they hate His church, His bride, with their behavior. They will never miss a Sunday service, yet act like an unbeliever Monday through Saturday. They carry a Bible with them, but they don't read it. And if they do read it, they refuse to re apply it. Out of the same mouth, as the book of James says, they have cursings and blessings. They do many things, but they make sure they post it on social media for everyone to see. They call Him Lord in front of others, but yet their fruit that Jesus speaks of in the verses before this, their fruits show that they really believe that they are their own God, that they won't be held accountable to their actions. They tell others how great of a believer that they are, yet they never exalt God in His mercy and grace. They proclaim what they have done for God instead of what God has done through the work of His cross. Whether they realize it or not, whether they realize it or not, pride has filled their hearts, and God will resist the proud. No one can be a citizen of the kingdom if they don't obey the king. We, are, we were created for his glory. When we are not bringing him glory, we are in sin and in rebellion. Now I asked you at the beginning of this message to examine your own heart. To look at your own salvation. And where does it lie? Have you believed on Christ? Has the Holy Spirit indwelled in you? Do you long to be sanctified or to be made holy? To grow in holiness? Are you convicted over your sin? Do you repent of it? Do you mortify? Do you die to sin daily? Do you love Christ and those who are His? Jesus says in John 13, By this all will know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. He that hateth his brother and say that he loves me is a liar. And truth is not in him. Do you love his law? Is it written on your heart? Has there been a change in your life from the time you made a profession? Do you have new life? Are you a new creation in Christ Jesus? Do you love the creator over the created thing? 
Or have you failed to keep His commandments? Have you loved your sin instead of hating it? Have you forsaken the assembling? Have you set your eyes on things that are not holy? Have you hated those who Christ made in His image? Have you hated Christ's bride? Have you put things above Him? If you have answered these questions, if so, do you fear that at the day of judgment, you will be one who He says, Depart from me, I never knew you. Now, I want you to suppose for a moment that you are not saved. Suppose for a moment that you are not saved. I do not care what you have done in the past. I do not care of what churches you have attended or for how long. I do not care what position you occupied while you were there. I do not care of your knowledge of the Scriptures, for the devil himself knows the Scriptures better than most of us in the room. I do not care what works you have done. Judas, Balaam, and Caiaphas all did mighty works for the Lord too. I do not care if you're 8 or 98. How long you have been in church matters none. Those works do not matter a bit if you do not have Christ. So let's suppose for a moment you are not saved. Now I know what you are thinking. I cannot think that way. I must not. But yet perhaps it may be true. And if it be true, if it be true, what mercy and compassion God Himself has found on you this very hour, that you may look to Jesus now and find eternal life, then finding out on that day where there will be no hope and it will be too late. Look at these words of Charles Spurgeon, what he said here. He said, once become bankrupt in the great business of life, and you are bankrupt forever. Once lose the battle of life, and your defeat is eternal. Imagine not, dream not, conjure up not to yourselves any false notion of a larger hope, lest you sink at last into a deeper disappointment. Do not wait to find out on that day where there will be no hope. Do not delay. Do not hesitate. Do not think on it any longer. 2 Corinthians 6, For God says, In the acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Call unto Him. Repent and turn from your sin. Cast all your cares and burdens on Him, for He cares for you. He says, Come unto Him, all who are weary and heavy laden, and He will give you rest. Cast your pride down in His feet and humbly cry out for mercy. Confess your sinfulness to Him and turn from it. Confess your lawlessness to Him and repent of it. For if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cry out to Him today and be forgiven. Believe on Him. And by believing on Him, you may know you have life in His name. For those who Christ has, He will never let go. For the Scripture says that all the Father has given Him, He will by no means cast out. The Good Shepherd knows His sheep. He gives His sheep eternal life, and no one can take them out of His hand. He who begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. By believing on Him, you go from being an enemy to a son or a daughter. I plead with you now, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. For I know in whom I believed, I am persuaded that He is able to keep which I have committed unto Him until that day. I want to end this morning's message with some verses out of John. 1 John 5. John says, he says, He who believes the Son of God and has the witness in himself, he who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed that the testimony of God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. 
And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. John continues to say, These things I have written to you, that you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Let us pray. God, for you are gracious, you are merciful, you are slow to anger, abounding in goodness. Your mercies are new every morning, and we thank you for your goodness, your goodness and your faithfulness to us. Lord, I pray for anyone this morning who these words have hit. Spirit of God, that you would pierce the soul, that you would take out that heart of stone and you would give them a heart of flesh, that you would give them new life today, Spirit of God. That they would call out to you, Christ, that they would be convicted over their sin, that they would call unto you and they shall be saved. And for the believer this morning who has been struggling, Lord, who has been walking, Spirit of God, give them assurance today. Comfort them. Let them know that they are a child of you, God. That you love your children. That you will by no means cast them out. But Lord, I pray for the one who doesn't know. That they would look unto you, Christ. That they would cry out to you. That you would have mercy. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. Be with us now as we respond in song. Thank you for you, Christ Jesus. Thank you for your word. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.